Hey, Olio, welcome to the show. I'm glad to be with you. So there's many things I can talk to you about, but I think a good start would be for the audience, give us a high level rundown of your career, because I know you've got a tremendous amount of achievements, but I think it'll be good to know a little bit about who you are before we get into the conversation. Yeah, I will try to summarize this because I always have problems um, summarizing yes. who I am and how people introduce me. So yesterday I was with my companion in this recent book that I wrote, Bruce Mao. Yeah. So Bruce Mao is introduced as a designer. Yeah. He worked with the best architects in the world, with Frank Gehry, Rem Kohlhaus. So Bruce Mao, designer. He did, and with me, some people have introduced me as, oh, I'm the dean of engineering, as a yeah. dean, I run computer science, apply math, apply physics, mechanical engineering, chemistry, all of that. Yeah. But I think I'm much more complex than that. So I, I'll start from the beginning, okay? Yeah, let's do uh, it. I, I grew up and I was blessed. I had a father who was in science. Yeah. So I grew surrounded by microscopes and things like that. He had a lab. And my mother was a classically trained artist. And I picked a lot of things from her. So I started painting a lot. And I painted through my high school education. And then going to the university, I had to decide if I wanted to be in art or I wanted to be in something else. And I picked engineering. This was the options in Argentina where I grew yeah. up. You were either a lawyer, engineer, or a doctor, let's say. And I kept the art there on the side. And eventually I came, got a PhD in, in the States. And my career evolved in direction of most physics and math, uh, chemical engineering, but very theoretical. Yes. I grew up um, with research in chaos, uh, very early enough that uh, for example, in the book by Glick on chaos, I'm yeah. there because there were very few people. And I had these two parallel lives, the, the artistic life and the math, science, engineering yeah. side separate. And at some point, I discovered that they were naturally kind of converging because a lot of, I mean, you cannot talk with people in math without encountering the word beauty and yeah. things like that. But so I had these two sides, the artistic and the scientific, let's say. But then I became, this sounds boring, a, a, an administrator. I became an chair of the department. It does sound yeah, boring. And, Why did you do that? Well, I discovered that I was good at that. <laughs> good at I it. Okay. That, I discovered that all my background in complex systems actually gave me some kind of advantage in this. Yes. And I discovered that you could be tremendously creative in this space. Uh, I became like a, an academic entrepreneur, imagining things, creating institutes, centers of various kinds, linking us with the medical school, the law school, you name it, I did it. So, and, and then I decided that maybe other people should see this unity of worlds. Yeah. The artistic world, the scientific technological world. And I decided that maybe I should start organizing notes to put this together. Yeah. And that happened over a span of 10, 12 years. And I had had conversations throughout with this a friend of mine who became my collaborator in this book, probably one of the most famous designers in the world now, is someone who kind of really find what design is. And then we tried to put this in some kind of physical way that will inspire others. And that's how I 
kind of reach where we are now. Um, this augmentation of knowledge that comes from, not knowledge, is creative spaces uh, and the ability to execute ideas. So there are these two things in this last thing that I have been talking about quite a bit. Yes. A augmentation of thinking spaces and ability to execute in this complex world that we live in. So that's kind of a summary of from beginning to end where I, where I am now. So when I was reading your work and I'm listening to you speak now, it would seem to me that for many people, art, technology, and science seem to be separate. But to me, they are very similar because you need all three to produce what you're trying to produce. I mean, to me, good design hides complexity. Uh huh. Absolutely. That's that's very clear. Yeah. But, but, but why but, is it that so much of the world sees them as separate? Well, uh, for various reasons. One is that if you sit in the technology side or science side, you tend to think that artists create in moments of epiphanies that they are constantly yes. on, that creativity is the, let's say, if you put science with discover and technology with invention, if you are asking lots of people outside art, what word goes with art, they will put creation. Now, no artist, and when I'm talking about artists, I'm talking about art now, yes. modern and contemporary art. No artist will put, creation is a byproduct. They will put words like provoke, insight, reveal, transform, educate. So from the side of science, we have this conception of art as being the romantic view that artists yeah. create when they are inspired. They don't see the perspiration. Yes. And actually you can see the whole point of a show in any museum is to show the evolution of something. You can see how something emerged, how something was created. In science, on the other side, um, the people from the art side think that artists and people in technology are cold and dispassionate, they don't see the passions that drive people in these spaces. And they also don't see, because when you create something in science or a final product in technology, no, one's, no one is interested in all the attempts that you made that didn't go anywhere. You just care about the final one. Yes. And so all the evolution is kind of hidden from view. And so people don't see that. And they think that this is rational way of doing things, which is not. It's there are lots of passions driving how people execute things on technology. But if you come from the art side, you don't see that. And even if you come from the fringes on the science side, you don't see that either. And the problem has to do that we, we, we live in these bubbles and within the bubble and mini bubbles that could exist within those bubbles. Um, well, let me kind of explain this way. Let's say mm -hmm. that you become a lawyer, okay? Yes. How do you become a lawyer? You become a lawyer by going to law school and what does law school do for you? You learn how to think like a lawyer, okay? So we, when you are in the circle of lawyers, you don't have to explain to anybody how lawyers think. You are in that group. Everybody thinks like you, kind of roughly. So you never have to go outside that bubble of the lawyers and explain to someone else, let me tell you how lawyers think. You never have to do that. In the same way that artists never have to explain how they think to someone outside art. Maybe they explain that to a critic or maybe in a show, but the opportunity that we have to learn how other people think are far and in between. Unless you are curious, unless you expand the circle of friends that you have, and unless you uh, go to places that are not the places that your tribe goes and are curious and ask questions, the, the opportunities of us learning how others think 
are kind of not open to us. You yeah. have to find out. And I think what I'm trying to say, it's kind of just not to be long-winded in here. I think we normally equate domains with the outcomes of the domains. Like, I don't know, a painter with a painting. Yes. Or a, a music with a final composition. But sometimes the process leading to that outcome is probably much more interesting and much more revealing and educational than the outcome itself. The process is probably more, but the only way that you have to discover the process is to educate yourself. And that's not always open to us. Okay, so what you're saying is very interesting. I wanna unpack this for the audience and then I'm gonna to lead to a question, okay? Uh -huh. So the first thing you said, which I hadn't thought about before, is you said that artists sometimes don't see the passion and emotion that goes into technologists and scientists in the process they use. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, sometimes scientists don't see the process that artists do. There's a lack of appreciation there. We assume uh -huh. artists are these emotional people. They have this epiphany. They work overnight and they produce something. But oftentimes, great art comes from a very, very well-considered process. Then the other point you made, which I thought was very interesting, is you that, that was a very, very good summary, Michael. By the way, oh, very, thank very, you, very, very good. Yeah. And then the other point you made, which I thought was very interesting, and I think I want to dig into this a lot more deeper, is that you said that oftentimes when you look at, let's say, a painting, we appreciate the painting, but we don't consider the process that went into that painting, the stops and starts, the influences, maybe the painter started with one style, he or she then covered it up after two years because they got influenced by another style. We don't understand the process. So I'm coming to the question here because it's a very interesting question. I'm a big car guy, I like cars. Mm -hmm. And I actually happen to know some of the head designers at some of the major automotive companies. And when you talk to these men, they almost always men, what surprises me is how mathematical and engineering based they are. Mm -hmm. So when you, when you look at this car, it evokes a certain feeling in you, whether it's a Ferrari or a Lamborghini or something, right? Mm -hmm. And as the end consumer, we only know that feeling the car gives us when we look at it. Yeah. But I, then when I, you I... sit down with the head designer and you ask him, you know, why does this car have this shape? There's a whole technological engineering, mathematical set of considerations that went into it. Yeah. And what I find so interesting is that here's this guy, hopefully there'll be a female at some point there, but here's this guy who's sitting in the middle, right? As the head designer and he knows, look, I've got the engineering team here. I've got the aerodynamics team. I've got the marketing team. They're all telling me the car needs to have this functionality. But on the other hand, I know my customers. And I need to take all of that and translate it into a design that's going to rev their engines for like, you know, no pun intended. Yeah, yeah. My, my question is that we've seen the power of merging the engineering side, the technical side with the artistic side. We've seen it in many sectors. Cars are a very good example of that. We know it works. Why haven't other sectors or industries learned from that? Well, I mean, the car is a fantastic example because I think the magic of something like Ferrari, for example, yeah. is you recognize the amazing engineering contained in the car. Yes. But at the same time, emotion, the sound, yeah, the, sound. the shape, everything is what makes, completes the package and makes Ferrari what it is. Uh, I mean, the problem with these things, I mean, uh, even for Harley Davidson that made yes. a career based on emotion, that's how you bought Harley. And now when you transition to e-bikes, yeah. uh, is how do you keep the same balance that you had, yes. that is what made the brand what it was. Um, so in some companies, I would argue that Apple managed to do this. Yes. And I think the magic of someone like Steve Jobs, if I can do some 
kind of cheap psychoanalysis in here, okay? <laughs> yes. uh, so I think that Steve Jobs, his soulmate, the person that he understood and was understood by was John Ives, yeah. the chief designer. But at the same time, he understood that if the company had to be run by someone who was not Steve Jobs, he understood the value of the most, mostly unseen part of Apple, which was attention to detail, delivery, supply chains. And so Tim Cook was the polar opposite of Johnny Ives. There you have an industrial engineer. And I think the calculation was maybe the culture of design can float above a company that is run by someone like Cook, but that the reverse probably couldn't have happened. That you have, you entrust everything to the mind of a designer and hope that everything else that has to do with precision, logistics, operations, still survives. So I think Apple, without design, Apple would be like any other company really. Yes. But it was the fusion of that, uh, not emotional to the level of I don't know, Lamborghini or a Ferrari, but the emotion conveyed by design and mostly unseen things that give you the sense of everything hanging together as a unit, but at the same time running like clockwork in the yes. background because you have all of those things completely figured out. So uh, I think it can be done that the two things can coexist. And that's basically the point that we're trying to make, which you kind of more or less articulated well. So if you come back to, to this merging, this fusion between art, technology, and science, if I look at the kinds of curriculums we have at universities and the formal and informal training grounds for young people, there seems to be a lack of appreciation of art and engineering, for example. There's a lack of appreciation of engineering and art, at least in the formal training grounds. It's almost as if you have to be lucky to be an apprentice to Johnny Ive or some car designer who sees the need to fuse them. So if we know it's there, why is the training so divided? Well, it depends on the place. In our case, we have it fused. Uh, for example, Bruce Mao is uh, someone in our faculty. Yes. And design is very big in here. And let me tell you why we have design as something big in here. The way that you learn in science and engineering is you first consume knowledge, courses, material, yes. and at the end you produce. Uh, at some point you take in all the courses and they tell you, okay, now you are set, go there, do something. That's completely different than the way that you learn how to write or how to paint. You don't take courses, theory of painting one, theory of painting too, yes. you start by painting. So the doing and the learning are more coexisting in art than in science. In yes. science, you consume and then you produce. So in here, what we do, and I don't want to advertise much what we do here in Northwestern, the, as soon as you show up, fresh from high school, but this goes all the way to MBAs fuse with us, yes. uh, which I will explain. Uh, you are put in a team of four. You are given a problem with a real client behind. The client could be, I don't know, a mother and a child. It's all the clients. Many of the problems come from the Rehabilitation Institute here in okay. Chicago. So it could be a boy that was born without arms. Oh, wow. And the client, the client is the boy and the mother. And what's the problem to solve? The boy wants to be more independent. So these teams of four students that fresh from high school, 
by the middle of the course, week five, they have to tell the client, we have thought about this, they have interviewed the client, we want to present three possibilities for you in such a way that the client can say, you know about possibility one, we like it, except this component. Possibility B, uh, we really appreciate the effort, but it's not for us. But you know what? We like this about possibility three. And every team, they, no one will ace this, really. Uh, you, you learn what you need as you go along, okay? Yeah. Because no one has prepared you for this question. And at the same level, kind of intermediate, we have had courses involving artists from the Art Institute of Chicago and engineers, teams of four. Uh, sometimes the course has been on giving people big data sets. Yeah. And the course having been themed something like data as art. And the point is they have to pick one of these data sets and they have to come up with a project. First, they have to agree, which is amazing that they do. Yeah. And deliver on this. So one course was, for example, a school's choice in Chicago. And I remember something that they did that was kind of remarkable to me. Uh, there is one map of the city of Chicago. There is one map of I don't know, any London, for example. However, if you are sitting at coordinates X, Y in any city, let's say Chicago, yeah. and you look at the city by how long it will take you to go in public transportation to any other point X prime, Y prime, the map becomes, there are infinitely many maps. It depends on where yeah. you are. And the, the ability to go to certain schools depends on transportation and a whole bunch of yeah. things. So this is what they agreed to do, which was amazingly surprising to me. At the same level, at the level more than just undergrads and even PhD students, we have a program for many years now in which people get an MBA plus a master's of design innovation. The MBA is from the Kellogg School of Management. The master of design innovation is from the McCormick School of Engineering. And in some sense, getting those two things, the program is small. It's no more than 65 students. It's very elite. Yeah. Uh, but in some sense, that's also joining two worlds. The world on how an MBA thinks and the world on how someone in design thinks. Now, there is no question that the set of all the ideas that you will have on how to attack a problem depends on what is the set of knowledge that you have acquired initially through education. And all the ideas that will come from as great as they may be, they will be from that set. But there's no question that you have two sets to draw from, you will have a richer set of possibilities and creative spaces. So I didn't mean to interrupt you, but what I think one of the things that jumped in my head is that, and I think the audience would want to know this too, what triggered this fusion at the school? What was missing in the graduates that made you realize you had to have this interdisciplinary approach? Well, a part was me, part but you. I, saw, I saw that there will be great opportunities for people who are adept at working at intersections between domains. Uh, that these people would be the connectors of ideas, sometimes the connectors of diverse teams, yeah. and you advertise who you are, you put the ideas out there in marketing and videos, and you say, this is who we are. If you think that you are aligned with this idea, come on in. And then we discovered our selectivity went through the roof. Uh, for example, in engineering, when I started, we were accepting like, I mean, everything changed, okay? Sure. But we were accepting one in four, and now it's like one in 11 or 12. Uh, so the market is there for people who resonate with these ideas. 
And the best advertisement of these, of course, like in anything, are the, the people that we, you produce. I mean, academia, by the way, is a very interesting business because it's probably one of the few business. I mean, we have lots of customers, okay? But yeah. clearly the students are a customer. Yes. I mean, it's probably one of the few businesses in which the customer is also your product. <laughs> I don't know, true, yes. uh, 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 maybe a health club could be similar, but yeah. so the, the, the way that you get better customers is by producing good products, really. So uh, have you seen an improvement in the products? How do you see that? Uh, I, I have seen a several fold increase, for example, in the number of innovations produced by the school, the number of patents, the number of startups. I mean, it's, this is a national trend, yes. but the numbers are spectacular. But I think the whole point, let me go to something. Um, you, you are a car guy. So this was told to me by someone who was also a car guy. And is this, basically what we are talking in here is the ability of having one pair of glasses Okay, the, educa the normal education that you get in any place, but somehow having the possibility of adding a second pair of glasses. And the possibility of adding the second pair of glasses sometimes is not easy. So the example that this person, you will tell me if this is correct or not. This person is one that takes cars to race circuits and I don't know, yeah. he's been trained by race car drivers and he said, what he said to me is the way that you drive a car, when you take a curve, you, know, you just move the steering wheel and you, you, the car goes around the curve. He said, but that's not how a race car driver takes a curve. In there is more balance, front wheels, back wheels, acceleration, braking. If you want to learn how to take a curve like a race car driver, you have to forget everything that you learn on how to drive a car in normal way. And I, I think that in many things, what will happen if you have two pair of glasses, and this is not bad, I think this is good. In fact, I think this, given the world and the complexity that we have now, sometimes what will happen is when we have these two pair of glasses, let's say, the typical MBA thinking glasses and the yeah. design thinking glasses, you may have an idea coming from one side that is completely opposite to the idea that you have from the other side. And you have to rationalize these things. You have to learn how to live with conflict. But my feeling is, my belief is that there are so many things now in the world and in decisions that we have to make that conflicts, managing conflicts, is unavoidable and you have to have the calm and ability to have these two opposing ideas sometimes in your head before you decide which one to take and not just immediately going to right or left in the things. You have to be able to kind of contemplate them for longer than usual until you find the perfect blend of things. And we were talking about how some things are both cold engineering and pure emotion, like, I don't know, driven by designing Ferrari and yes. engineering. And I think both can coexist. And the people who manage this coexistence, in my opinion, are people who do amazingly well because you have to be able to operate in many instances at the intersection of two domains. What you're saying is very, very interesting. It actually makes me remember a story, an incident from my past. In my previous life, I used to be a senior partner in consulting and corporate strategy and corporate finance. And I remember there's one particular engagement whereby we were brought in by a major energy company to figure out what should be their R&D strategy. So how should they commit money? Should they go for these pie in the sky, blue sky concepts, or should they do more incremental engineering or more maintenance kind of R&D? And we did the study and one of the things that we realized is that a clever way for this company to innovate 
was not necessarily to develop things themselves, but to find a problem they were facing and find some other company outside their sector was facing a similar problem, find what they were doing and bring it into their sector. And at the time, I thought that was a very clever way that we thought it through the team as such. There's obviously a whole team working on this. But what's interesting about this is that it comes back to what you're saying. If you only have blinders on and you see things only from your perspective, you miss out on the opportunities to sort of inject new ideas and inspirations from other places. And related to this, I remember when we were doing corporate strategy work, we would have a policy of looking what was happening in corporate finance and introducing those ideas into corporate strategy, even ideas that were 40 years old in corporate finance, they were new in corporate strategy. Oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's such a simple I mean, way. They, it's exactly what you're saying. You don't have to do new things. Just the idea of having separate things together sparks new ideas. Uh -huh. Absolutely. I mean, one, one example that unfortunately cannot be repeated because regarding blue sky and applications that have everything in one roof. Well, and they could do it because money was no option. Yeah. They had a monopoly. It was Bell Labs. Yes, and absolutely. And AT&T. Yeah. I mean, that was the perfect synergy between pure, pure blue in the pie in the sky research yes. and applications. I mean, the, this, the, but it's hard to repeat now because, I mean, money was no option. Time was absolutely irrelevant in there. And for a while, they produce, I don't know, something like a dozen, dozen Nobel Prizes in there. Yes. Plus, I don't know how many technological innovations, which it was unheard of. And we're still seeing the impact of that because foundational research that leads to things that win a Nobel Prize, it takes decades to be commercialized. Oh, absolutely. So the stuff that Bell Labs worked on, some of those things are still entering the market in some format, somewhere in the world. Oh, I can see that. Um, um, I was in the, in fact, I chair a committee for the National Academy of Engineering uh, called the Draper Prize. The Draper yes. Prize, along with the Queen Elizabeth Prize are the biggest prizes in engineering. They are like the Nobel Prizes of engineering, really. And they are awarded for technologies that have impacted the world big time. Um, fiber optics could be one, transistors, that kind of thing. You still see in the nominations things coming from the old days of Bell Labs and IBM, for example. Yes. And one question that one can have is, where, now we can see lots and lots of effort put in AI and the metaverse and that kind of thing. Yes. Uh, but I don't know if there's enough diversity of things going on there. You wonder where the Nobel Prize is 20 years from now they are going to be coming from. Uh, in the past, it was a blend between private sector and yeah. academics. I don't know how this will play out in the future. It's also a function of where that original research is taking place. For a long time, it was the United States primarily. Japan, mm -hmm. Europe, now you've got China which is playing a role. And of course, Chinese culture will play a role in how that foundational research is being commercialized. So, you know, we talk about pure research, but based on where the pure research is taking place, based on the culture in terms of how it's commercialized that introduces yeah. uh -huh. other forms of uh, variety that, and we don't know what the implications would be. Yeah, absolutely. No, I mean, uh, this is more availability of funding, uh, intellectual protection, a whole bunch of things. I mean, this is, is not just a great idea and somehow you expect to trickle down to something that is technologically feasible. I mean, it's much more complicated than so that. So if, if you think about it, it's almost another area or the next area where countries will compete to stay ahead of the pack. I mean, the United States has to be good at this, merging our technology and science to stay ahead of our competitors. But are we treating it as a national imperative? No, no. And, they, and there are hurdles for this. Uh, one big hurdle, for example, 
So if you are a student in any major university as an undergrad in the US. Yes. Um, where, by the way, if you decide to go into medicine or law, you cannot go straight from high school to law school in here, okay? So you are forced to go through these four years as opposed to, let's say, England or even Argentina, many yeah. places in Europe. So if you're an undergrad, you have a lot of flexibility in the courses you take. You are a master of your own destiny. In yeah. some cases, like we have this, you can create your own major. You have to convince us, but you can create your own major. Uh, and maybe your parents are paying for education, or maybe you have a fellowship, but you have the flexibility. Once you are in a doctoral program and you are funded by the National Science Foundation okay. or the Department of Energy or NIH, whatever, there are lots of this accountability on how you are using your time, effort reporting, and the advisor who has to produce research, they usually look at students with a short time horizon. We need papers because we need to apply for an next grant. They don't look 10 years ahead on how someone who works with you, who is more broadly trained, will do in the world. So the ability that you have as a doctoral student to kind of drift from your topic of research and broaden your education by taking courses that are outside the main area of interest are much more limited. Yeah. So we are creating people who are needlessly unidirectional. So we're and forcing deep specialization. Exactly, yeah. The system is forcing them to be much more specialized than at least I would like to. Now, if you know how to maneuver the system, you can find these opportunities. But you have to have the inner drive or someone has to make it clear that this is possible. Or there needs to be an incentive to do that. Exactly. Now, in the incentive part, uh, at the moment, is almost lacking. Uh, no one can tell you for sure, oh, if you do this, you're going to find much better jobs. No, it has to be part of your inner desire that you want to do this because you are deriving pleasure from this. You think that your brain is expanding with a broader set of ideas and possibilities, but a lot will depend, as I said before, customers, products, where the people that you produce go. And if there are people who are trained in this broader way and end up going to places that you are dreaming of, you are going to take the same route. It eventually what we are talking in here is the hardest thing to change in any organization, which is the culture of yes. the place. Yes, because the way it works is that by fusing all these disciplines, you've produced these graduates who should do better at their work and their design and problem solving and so on. If they do better, the companies that hired them would say, hold on a second, these guys are doing better. So we need more of these students, uh -huh. which means yeah. they'll put pressure on universities to supply these students. Yeah. So that's what we hope would happen anyway. Yeah. Yeah. And, but it's a long process. This is almost like a 15, 20 year process. Isn't well, it? I mean, a, a, academia is like producing a fine scotch or fine wine. I mean, yes, because yes. You, produce, you produce people that will pick 10 years yeah. after they graduate, 15 years. In fact, the whole place depends on everybody that you have produced. Maybe it's an inventory of 40 years that is still alive and doing great things. And the value of the place depends on the collective value that these people are producing, whatever endeavor they are. That's why the process is so, so slow. Now you can, Changing the culture is tough, 
but it can be done. I think we yeah. have done it here. Well, we've had moments in American history when we've changed the culture incentive funding model for science and arts and so on. Yeah. But what seems to be lacking now is a threat mm -hmm. to galvanize people to change. Because if I look at all the changes that took place, there was some kind of threat that came our way. Mm -hmm. But there yeah. doesn't seem to be that unifying enemy there anymore. Yeah. And it's sad to think that, you know, we need a threat to be to change. <laughs> but unfortunately, that's how humans work, right? Yeah. Yeah, it was, I don't know, the Sputnik. The uh, Sputnik in moment. The six, in the 60s, yeah, yeah. Something has always galvanized us, but it seems to be missing. So it's almost as if we benefited from having a common, easily identifiable enemy in the past, and we don't seem to have that now. Mm -hmm. and which is a sad indictment of humanity that we need an enemy to coalesce around. <laughs> but unfortunately, that's the way funding seems to work in Congress. Yeah, well, you, you could clearly say the enemy is us now. The enemy is us. And unfortunately, yeah. we may be the most fearsome enemy of all because it's hard to change who we are. Yeah. So what, what happens here? I mean, the message makes sense. The concept makes sense. Where are you going to take this now? What's the next step for you? Well, uh, it's remarkable the number of places that I have given talks recently. I mean, I gave a talk for 500 people in IBM. I have given talks about this in the past for Accenture, uh, Boeing. Yes. Uh, I have given a talk uh, a couple of weeks ago in Miami, which was interesting because Miami is a place that completely changed who they are. Um, they used to be nowhere, for example, in the art scene. And now with Basel, Miami, they are probably yeah. the top place in North America. Now that you mention it, Miami turns up a lot in the press. I know. And I, I, and I think is a living proof the, the talent attracts talent more than money attracts talent because the tech scene in Miami is changing. What was the catalyst that drove this revival of Miami? Was there any particular strategy behind it? I give, I, give you an, I give you my answer, which is probably off the wall in here. Yeah. Something that changed Miami. So we have two fabulous parking lots in this university, which blend completely with every building. If you don't know that they are parking lots, you will think that they are great buildings. Yeah. Miami became famous because of one parking lot. They, they asked the, the Swiss architectural partnership of Herzog de Meron to design a parking lot and parking lots in Miami became a signature, became an architectural element that no one was thinking about. Yeah, nobody and, thought about that time. No, and, and I think that that it's hard to say how that increased confidence, but at some point, and I do not know details, someone made a deal with Basel to bring Basel to Miami. And that has been a resounding, resounding success. I mean, the, uh, the number of people who come uh, span something like 30 countries now, it's probably the biggest thing now in North America. And, and you want to be in places where there is some kind of manifestation of ideas mm. sort of bubbling up. Yes. Uh, and it's hard to do this by decree. Uh, it kind of happens more organically. Uh, something that I'm a firm believer of and is kind of the second kind of theme in the team, the how to operate in a complex world. So it happens, my research, when I grew up, I made reference to this was in chaos and complex systems. And something in complex systems that is the defining characteristic of a complex system is the complex, is the, is the concept of emergence. And okay. is what happens when elements come together to produce something that is much more 
than the elements themselves, okay? I mean, the ultimate example would be you can study neuron to death and never be able to sort of envision how this collection of neurons connecting could produce a brain and consciousness. So emergence is something that uh, I think is something that people in leadership positions should pay a lot of attention to. In fact, yeah. I would argue that the ability to produce conditions for successful emergence should be one characteristic, defining characteristic of a leader. It doesn't mean that you just wait for the emergence to occur. You have to plant the seeds. So I think that Miami has been almost example of that emergence, which by the way, if you go historically back, I mean, why on earth, uh, I don't know, Renaissance Florence produces amazing output I mean, no one was planning for that, except that things combine to make it a place where ideas kind of emerge for 200, 300 years, a one more interesting than the other one, or at some points in Edinburgh, or a, a, so emergence is an important thing that more people should pay attention to. And there are many things connected with complexity and complex systems that I think people should know more about that kind of thing now than before. Uh, especially since, ev since connectedness rule our lives. I mean, sometimes we see how things are connected because I don't know a ship gets trapped in the Suez Canal and you see how everything gets distorted in supply chains. But I think that knowing something about complex systems in my view, helps a lot with managing things. As I said, I would I discovered that somehow this gave me an advantage in running you know, an organization like a School of Engineering. But I think this is important in no matter what kind of activity you're in. Uh, we, we live in a world in which is much more connected than before where small things can produce amazing big consequences. So something like this should be a necessity in the training of anybody who goes and evolves into, I don't know, strategy and dreaming up where things should go. What you're saying makes so much sense. And I'm gonna paraphrase some of this for the audience. When you look at the study of life, one of the, the big questions is what were the conditions that existed millions of years ago on earth that created this primordial soup that created the conditions for life? But one of the things we don't ask of business leaders or leaders in general is what are the conditions that need to exist to create economic life? We, we don't ask those questions, but it's a very interesting thing because when you're telling me the story about Miami, I, I got to thinking about it. And I remember many years ago when I was a consultant, I was visiting the city in Colombia, which had just been coming through the guerrilla wars and many bad things happened in Colombia. But the city was seeing a revival. And I, I spoke to the mayor and had dinner with him, lunch with him and so on. And I wanted to know what did he do that the other cities were not doing? Because there was no reason why objectively his city should be seen as safer and start attracting investments and so on. And I expected him to tell me, you know, he beefed up the police force, he was prosecuting crime and so on. But he said, actually, what happened is that there was a uh, graffiti artist who one night decided to paint over the left side of a building that was facing a freeway. And what happened is that rather than persecuting this guy and prosecuting them and so on. Well, they first couldn't find him in the first place, but the owners of the building decided that it looked so good, they're just gonna leave it up. And other artists came forward and offered to do similar designs. And that city became famous for the striking murals on their buildings over the freeways and so on. And the mayor said that if you had to trace the revival of the city, it started there because it gave people some brightness 
and it showed that they were open to new ideas. And, and thinking about the Miami story, when you talk about parking lots, it sounds a little bit absurd, but if you think at how does economic life start, it usually starts with some really unusual creative change. So that mm -hmm. story makes a lot of sense to me. And I think one of the things all business leaders should ask is, all leaders in general, is what conditions do I need to create to create economic life? Because if you think about it, a city that has oil, for example, it's easy to attract investment because people come for the oil. Mm -hmm. But what happens when you have no reason to bring money? How do you bring investment in then? You've got to create some sense of vitality and revival, right? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, the, the other thing, art sometimes flourishes under the most adverse conditions. Okay. And some would argue it usually flourishes under yeah, the most yeah, adverse conditions. Yeah, yeah. So uh, maybe we'll see absolutely first rate class art emerging from I don't know, Detroit here. But uh, I'm sure that, uh, and by art, what I'm talking about mostly in the book is visual plastic art. Yes. Okay? But there is no question that if you put theater and writing and all even music, uh, sometimes those things will emerge in places that the conditions were less than optimal for a, any creative process. In fact, when I came to the US, mm -hmm. uh, so I was coming from Argentina. And in Argentina, um, I had been in the Navy. I was an officer in the Navy. Mm -hmm. And one thing that helped my mind occupy in, in creative endeavors was I was painting. I did exhibit when I was actually in the Navy. Yes. And when I came to the US, everything was so calm that somehow was, I got almost deflated. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. in, in, the need of, in the need of doing things to express myself. And I wouldn't say that this is a great example of why people need adverse conditions, but you probably heard that the enemy of art is the absence of constraints. Uh, yeah. Orson Welles said this. I, I would say that if the worst thing that you can tell someone in any creative endeavor is, okay, do something, there are no constraints, yeah. nothing, nothing no con you have money, you have everything, go and No, you need some constraints sometimes to do something significant. In fact, the constraints may be essential in how something comes out that no one thought before. I mean, one good example, I mean, I'm sure you know Falling Water, the house of Frank Lloyd Wright in Pennsylvania. Yeah. It's not that Frank Lloyd Wright wanted to do a house with a kind of waterfall kind of coming from the middle of the house. He was given that lot by, I don't remember who the name of the client was, and said, I want a house in this lot. And no one had probably imagined that you could build a house with a stream of water flowing underneath and a water. But without that, without that constraint, the, I'm the client and I need a house here, falling water wouldn't exist. So you, you need always some kind of constraint. And that's why, for example, I think it's good in programs that we do in design here, where the design has to be, let's say, for Africa, because the constraints that you have there significant. are more significant than the one that you have here. If you are building some kind of biomedical device, it better be something that can be repaired easily, that is cheap. So constraints enhance creativity. And I think the constraints don't have to be about creating artistic things. We all operate with constraints. You can see constraints as something to get rid of, or you could see them as something that you embrace. And embracing constraints I think is a good mental space to be in, in my view. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. I remember when I was working in Africa uh, many years ago, and um, I would use mobile banking in Africa. And then when I moved to the United States, I was shocked how far behind the times we are in mobile banking versus what's happening in Africa. You can do your full banking over SMS in Africa. Yeah, yeah. And why can you do that? Because it's the only way they can do it. 
Yeah, they skip, they skip lots of steps. Exactly, <laughs> and it's because of what you said, those enormous constraints of illiteracy, lack of broadband, lack of internet penetration, all of those things were missing. So what do they have to do? They have to build the most simple system in the world to do online banking. But because we don't have those constraints here, we never leapt that far ahead. Absolutely, yeah. And this is just I a beautiful example of how, you know, a lot of times when companies, people, teams face traumatic situations, we must always appreciate that this is an opportunity to respond to it. Uh-huh, completely agree. And sometimes we actually forget that. We get caught up in the drama and the trauma of why it's so difficult. But, you know, I remember um, I was talking to these programmers from the former Soviet Union, and, and I was asking them, you know, why is it that code that comes out of that part of the world tends to be so light? But why is it so practical and it tends to be smaller in, in bite size and so on? And I thought, you know, maybe they had some brilliant answer for me. And they told me, well, the reason is simple. The computers in the former Soviet Union were so minimal, we had to write programs that could fit onto them because we just didn't have the space. Yeah, no, that's a fantastic example. It's amazing, right? And, and I'm going to leave you with, with, with one more example, right? When I was doing work in Russia, I was, um, I can't remember who it was, I was talking to some government official. No, no, it wasn't a government official, it was, someone, it was someone from a bank. And they were talking to me, well, you know, if Russia had been more peaceful and had taken better care of its people, it would have had a more thriving arts scene of classical mu music and writing and so on. I remember a government official sitting across from the table said that if Russia had been more peaceful, we would never have had an art scene. Yeah, well, I mean, think of Shostakovich, or even oh, Malevich. Tchaikovsky, yeah, 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 Rachmaninoff. Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, we wouldn't want those lives on anyone, but that was part of the creative process. Yeah, absolutely. I'm thinking of Shostakovich and the Leningrad. Yes, it's Seems amazing, like, yeah, right? Yeah, because yeah. The, Russia has had a traumatic past. Even Germany, I mean, we forget that Germany is not an old country. It's a young country. Mm -hmm. It was merged in the 1870s, you know, under Bismarck, and then it became a nation. But through that period, it had some of its greatest scientific and cultural achievements. Mm -hmm. And you always wonder, what would German science have been? Like, I mean, you're a scientist. You know, at one stage, the Germans were winning... Nobel Prizes in chemistry and physics more than anyone else. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, would they have been able to do that if they had not been through that trauma? And the answer is, you actually don't know. But the fact is, they did have to go through that trauma. And sometimes well, they I mean, underappreciate wh things. One of the things that I... It's hard for me to say what art I like, okay, or prefer. Yeah. Prefer. I can tell you lots of things. But one reason that I like German expressionism is that you can almost see in paintings by Beckman mm -hmm. how the world was going to be. Yes. It's almost like a window into the future. It's a message. Uh, yeah, yeah. That's what it is, right? He found a way to give a message through art. Mm -hmm. So the whole point, uh, if, if there is one summary thing, I think it's really important to educate ourselves, force ourselves to understand how other people think in different yeah. domains. Is Expose the consequences that. are enriching in many levels. I mean, not the least that you cannot have a successful career and discover that when you're retiring that somehow now you should learn how to appreciate music and art it cannot be done on demand. It has to be a continual process, but it has benefits throughout, in my view. Uh, I mean, I wouldn't say that people go to curated events, I don't know, like TED or the Aspen Institute or whatever, mm -hmm. because you encounter people at the frontiers of thinking in many areas, and that gives you a glimpse on how the next thing will be. But you also, in many of these events, you encounter people that normally you wouldn't encounter in your day-to-day -day work. And, yes. and I think that's part of the attraction.
the principle of cross-pollination. Julio, yeah. thank you so much. I really enjoyed that conversation. I think our audience is really going to like it. It's timely, I would say. Well, thank you so much, Michael. It was, it was very, very good. Um, and as I said, some of these ideas, I don't claim that they are for everybody. I think that for the people who manage to be at the nexus, there are going to be great opportunities awaiting for them because it's almost a safeguard for sudden transitions in the world. Yes. Uh, you are more prepared, you are more robust. Um, I mean, one of the best comments I got about, for example, the book, and it was a podcast that had to do with AI and human yeah. and machine interaction. At the very end, the woman said to me, you know, this book couldn't have been written by a machine. That's a wonderful bookend. Yeah, but the point of, of this is you always have to be thinking of what kinds of things you do that could be replaced by a machine. That's true. A lot of things are still going to be replaced. I know, I know. Michael, a pleasure talking to you. And you as well. I hope you have a great day. We'll definitely be in touch. I'll send you an email. Fantastic. Catch up from Fant there. Fantastic. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you. Take care. Ciao. Bye-bye.